given the level of public concern about the recent cases uh, in, uh, in America regarding Americans uh, related to Ebola, I wanted to communicate with all of our Philadelphians and people in the viewing area about our own city's preparedness to deal with uh, this and other infectious diseases. Obviously, Philadelphians and all Americans are appropriately concerned about and certainly monitoring the Ebola situation in America and in, on the continent of Africa. As a matter of course, though, the city of Philadelphia is always working to prepare uh, for any possible uh, circumstantial situation and certainly uh, any current uh, hazard of which is of great uh, interest to Americans and a significant amount of media coverage as well. We take all threats, the safety of Philadelphians and anyone else who is here, and the welfare of our citizens extremely seriously, and that includes highly infectious diseases. During the last few weeks, numerous members of our city's leadership have had a number of meetings, conference calls, internally and externally with many partners and stakeholders to discuss our own infectious disease preparedness plans and the specific threat that Ebola could potentially present to Philadelphia. Last week, I personally participated in a call with President Barack Obama, the DHS Secretary, the HHS Secretary, and a number of other federal officials along with fellow mayors and governors across America to discuss how cities and states are preparing should they need to deal with potential treatment for an Ebola patient. It's really about extremely high levels of collaboration, coordination, and cooperation across all levels of government, city, state, and federal, with key stakeholders like hospitals, first doctors and nurses and other hospital personnel, airports, airline staff, security screeners, and our own staff at Philly International first responders, EMS, paramedics, police officers, firefighters. President Obama provided an update to the American people just yesterday in the evening about the status of two nurses who have been transferred to different facilities for treatment, what the CDC is doing about those two patients and the entire Texas Presbyterian Hospital community, and how the United States is working to treat this disease at its source in West Africa. Yesterday, I also had a conversation directly uh, with uh, my friend and mayor, uh, Mike Rawlings, uh, in Dallas. The president also reminded us, again, that this disease is not an airborne disease. It is not easy to catch. You can only contract this disease by being in contact with the bodily fluids of an individual that, no, that not only has it, but is symptomatic. Let me repeat that. The President and other officials who are experts in this area have reminded us time after time this particular disease is not an airborne disease. It is not easy to catch. You can only contract this particular disease by being directly in contact with the bodily fluids of someone who is who not only has it, but is actually demonstrating symptoms of the disease. However, the President and the federal government, the Department of Health and Human Services, the CDC, even the Defense Department, and our national security teams are taking this very seriously. And of course, as such, we in the city of Philadelphia take it seriously as well. Just as the President assured all Americans that his team is working hard on this issue, I want to reassure all of our Philadelphians and folks uh, in our area that our team is also working very, very hard, and we know what we are doing. We have experience dealing with other infectious disease outbreaks, such as SARS and H1N1. We're running practice exercises and updating emergency response plans, providing protective equipment and training to our first responders. The city is, in fact, taking all the necessary steps to train for any infectious disease emergency. This is what we always do. But there's always more to do. As 
there's more to do, there's more to learn, there's always more training that can be provided, there's always more equipment, supplies that we will need, and we'll do what we need to do in this particular instance. Of course, we would hope that Ebola never reaches Philadelphia, but we always have to prepare for any potential threat. And as a result, we will in fact be ready to contain it, to treat this particular disease should we find a case in Philadelphia. One last thing and then you'll hear from a couple other speakers. One other concern that I, that I have and I know a number of others uh, in Philadelphia have, and it's an appropriate concern, and that's that we uh, do all that we can uh, to not only be supportive of the efforts of others uh, around the world and across nations, but also right here in Philadelphia, given the diversity of our population, we have individuals who are of uh, African continent, nation, ancestry. Have folks who are here from any number of different nations. Some that are now even experiencing uh, this particular threat. I'm asking all Philadelphians and people in the region, would you please never treat someone differently because they may be, or their family may be, from a particular area that is experiencing this challenge. Let us not have any prejudice or predisposition in our minds and in our hearts about uh, what a person's status may be just because they may emanate uh, from, or may have come from a particular country, or have family members that may be from a particular country. Uh, let us uh, always uh, keep uh, the better nature of our interests uh, in our hearts and in our minds uh, as we deal with uh, these particular issues and challenges uh, and treat everyone with the appropriate dignity and respect that they deserve as human beings. I want to bring up a few of our leaders, provide additional details about the preparations of that in their respective areas and coordinated across a variety of areas that these leaders are putting in place to respond to any potential threat. With that in mind, let me ask first our Health Commissioner, Dr. James Bueller, to come to the podium. Thank you, Mayor Letter. Let me apologize to the group in advance. I'm getting over a cold. I don't believe I'm contagious, but I am a little hoarse, and I might have a lingering cough. I would just like to re-emphasize some of the points that Mayor Letter has just made. First, the Philadelphia Department of Public Health and its preparations to deal with Ebola rests on a long-standing basis of experience in dealing with a diverse variety of infectious disease threats. For example, our experience in preparing for the SARS epidemic or the H1N1 epidemic a number of years ago, but also just our day-to-day -day experience in dealing with more common infectious disease problems of, you know, that can affect public health. Our work in Ebola preparedness is also based on more general all hazards emergency preparedness planning that we do with other sectors of city government and with our partners and neighbors throughout the Philadelphia region. Some of you may have heard my testimony yesterday to city council. I'm not going to go into that same depth, but just to highlight some of the key areas and touch upon the points that I've made. Since the outset of this problem, we have been working to make sure that we are fully abreast of all the latest federal guidelines and recommendations, the latest data, the latest evidence, and, and the recommendations at the federal level that we need to then take and translate and apply and push out to Philadelphians. That includes the healthcare community, healthcare providers, the hospitals, doctors, etc., but also to the public. These materials are there uh, on our webpage and they also get pushed out uh, in other more active ways. We've also been collaborating with other city agencies that will have an important role in, in this arena if Ebola does touch us. We provide expertise and consultation in ways to protect against Ebola and the nature of the disease. We've also been collaborating with our hospitals in the city 
with infectious disease and infection control specialists to make sure that they have the latest information, but also to hear their questions and concerns and to respond to them. We've been working with a variety of partner organizations, particularly organizations that represent the West African community here in Philadelphia, to make sure that they have the information that they need to, to share, to, to keep their, their constituents up to date. And throughout this process, we've been providing updates, but more recently in the last few weeks, especially since the situation has unfolded in Dallas, we've escalated a number of these efforts in terms of our outreach and engagement with hospital partners, and particularly our outreach and engagement with members of the, uh, and leaders from the West African community. We heard yesterday from our hospital colleagues their confidence uh, in their preparedness, although we also heard that there's debate about that in the conversation, and, and we need to remain an important part of that conversation. Again, to reiterate a few key points that Mayor Nutter has made. People with Ebola are not contagious unless they, until they get sick. And the sicker they get, the more contagious they're likely to be. If a person has not developed Ebola, has not developed symptoms, he or she is not contagious. The timeline between the exposure and when someone might develop disease could be as soon as two days, but it could be as late as 21 days. On average, it's around eight to 10 days. You can only get Ebola from direct contact with the body fluids of someone who is sick. You cannot get it from contact with a person who is a contact of somebody with Ebola, unless obviously that person has to come in. If you have traveled within the past 20 day, 21 days from a country in West Africa where this outbreak remains active, <coughs> And, and the important word here is and, you have symptoms such as fever, vomiting, diarrhea, other symptoms. Then the thing to do is to call 911. Our 911 responders, and you'll be hearing more from our fire commissioner, which is over the emergency medical services, is now, when appropriate, screening callers about their travel history and if a caller does have that travel history, they will be prepared to safely transport that person to a hospital where they should be evaluated in a hospital emergency room. It's also extremely important to keep in mind that many other diseases that are common in West Africa and other parts of Africa can cause similar symptoms. And so as these patients are evaluated, it's likely that other diagnoses will often be discerned. Two particular issues that arose yesterday as a result of the council hearings were questions about the adequacy of personal protective equipment and questions about regionalization or specialization of care. CDC issued guidance earlier this summer for the use of personal protective equipment in the care of persons with Ebola disease. We understand that CDC is, is planning or is likely to update this guidance possibly as early as today or early next week. As we have done with other guidance from the federal government, we will take this guidance, review it carefully, make any adaptations that make sense for us here in Philadelphia and push that out to the people that, that need to have that information. The second question concerns the issue of regionalization of care. All hospitals, all hospital emergency departments should have the capacity and be prepared to safely evaluate a patient who is suspected of having Ebola based on the history of travel within the past 21 days to one of these countries, as, as well as their symptoms. And it's important to note that when those patients come in for evaluation, other reasons for their illness might be found, or, or, or perhaps likely to be found. And our staff, our infectious disease experts, are available 
to consult 24-7 with those emergency room physicians if they have any questions about the evaluation of those patients. As you know, we do not have uh, public hospitals here in Philadelphia, but we, we have a very strong network of, of, of hospitals here. We are fortunate to have excellent uh, hospital capacity in Philadelphia. And within these hospital networks, if a patient does have Ebola and the doctors and nurses who are taking care of that patient believe that he or she needs a higher level of care, then transfer to another facility within the, our existing networks might be indicated. But that's really going to be the call of the, the doctors and nurses taking care of those patients. We will continue to, to stay abreast of guidelines, national guidelines, and to adapt them for our use here in Philadelphia. And we'll continue to work closely with our colleagues at the State Health Department here in, in Pennsylvania on these issues. Because as, as many of you heard, Governor Corbett gave a press conference this afternoon, and by his side was my counterpart, Michael Wolf, Secretary of Health for the State of Pennsylvania, and we are in close contact with, with Dr. Wolf. I plan to speak later today, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf. I plan to speak later today with Secretary Michael Wolf of the State Health Department regarding any updates from the state on each of these two questions. Again, thank you for your interest and concern, and at the appropriate time, we'd be happy to answer questions. I'm also joined by several of my colleagues from the health department, whom I may ask to assist in questions if it requires their particular expertise and knowledge. Thanks, Dr. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Fire Commissioner Sawyer, and then after him, uh, Emergency <coughs> Management Director uh, Sam Phillips. Good afternoon. I'll take questions at the end, but uh, let, let, first let me say a few words about the fire department's preparedness and protection against the spread of infectious diseases, including Ebola viruses. To ensure that the department was fully prepared, I directed my team to take the following measures to protect the community and the first responders or emergency responders. And that begins with 911 calls. The fire department 911 call takers are now using an infectious disease surveillance tool to help screen calls for responses to potential Ebola cases. Calls are asked if they have traveled to affected West African communities or have been in contact with anyone who has traveled to those areas. Emergency responders are alerted to potential Ebola cases if that's the case. The next phase will be personal protective equipment. The department provides the following equipment. Infection control kits include fluid resistant gowns, surgical masks, face shields, boot covers, and head covers, hand sanitizer, and a chemical disinfection OPI slide three, which the CDC says is compliant with dis disinfecting Ebola and other infectious diseases. The department is supplementing its current inventory of infection control supplies by ordering an additional 1,700 kits and will maintain adequate supplies as needed. Patient containment. Suspected Ebola patients who display severe signs and symptoms will be placed in the containment unit to prevent any additional contam contamination to, to the community or the first responders. This is above and above, this is above and beyond CDC requirements. Training. The department is reinforcing the established standards and pro proper procedures for utilizing personal protective equipment through hands-on practical training with emergency responders, namely our paramedics first and then the rest of our first responders. EMS officers have received training delivered by the department's infection control officers. These officers are in the process of delivering this training throughout the whole department. Recovery, if there is a case. Dining and doffing of personal protective equipment for suspecting bold responses will be done with an EMS supervisor on scene. This will ensure that no breaches in protocol occur. 
if you were to check and look, there have been no incidences where protective equipment has failed. All the cases lead back to not following proper protocol when taking on or putting on the equipment. All potentially contaminated clothing and materials will, will be appropriately discarded. This is part of our protocol. According to the CDC's recommendations, decontamination procedures are not indicated for Ebola or infectious disease responses. Once again, I'll take the, uh, any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sam Phillips, and I'm the Director of Emergency Management. I have the good fortune of just summarizing a few of the points made previously by my colleagues. Uh, first, I just want to emphasize what you've heard from the Mayor, the Health Commissioner, and the Fire Commissioner, that um, Ebola is not an imminent threat here. And I want to just emphasize that we have an excellent system here in the city of Philadelphia and with our partnering agencies at hospitals and in healthcare systems and nonprofits to handle this. And it's important that we just continue to use the tools and the procedures and the plans that we've developed and that we've trained on and that we've exercised on as we take this in stride. So again, just kind of re resorting back to our good management and our good collaboration. A few things that um, we have already done for Ebola, as mentioned by the mayor, we've convened some really strategic conference calls to make sure that, particularly on the city side, that everybody is on the same page, has the same access to information, that that information is appropriately vetted and shared. We're working with first responders to make sure that they have all of the tools that they need. We've been revising some planning documents that we've been working on, um, and we'll continue to do those things for the foreseeable future. Certainly, if needed, we'll ramp up our operations. Um, if you know it gets to that point, we do have the city's emergency operations center. And an activation of that facility should not come at any sort of alarm. It's just to provide enhanced coordination for city agencies. Um, again, I just wanted to take a few minutes to remind folks that we do have a great system here. We've worked really hard over the past few years, not only with infectious disease, but lots of other hazards. And I, we just need to remember those protocols, take this in stride, and we'll be able to appropriately manage this. Dr. Bueller, Commissioner Sawyer, and uh, Director Phillips, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think that um, after hearing uh, from these experts uh, in these areas, I, I think the real bottom line message here uh, to all Philadelphians really has to be uh, that uh, we need folks to stay focused, be calm, but we're prepared for this, uh, and we are ready uh, should we face a particular threat but we maintain our vigilance and uh, we will stay on top of all the protocols and procedures that are necessary to ensure that our citizens and uh, our highly skilled and trained workers, our first responders, are protected uh, as well. It's a dual responsibility uh, and we take this work very, very seriously. So with that, uh, we'd be glad to try to answer any questions that you may have. There, the question question was raised, and this may go to the fire commissioner, perhaps. Um, question was raised about the two levels of protected suits: the ones that the department got post anthrax or during the anthrax, and this level. One is obviously higher than the other. The union feels obviously the higher should be used. Obviously, you feel that these are adequate. Can someone address that the difference between the two and why the city has chosen to use these versus the higher level protection? Let me make an initial response to that. The, the protective equipment that we have recommended to our fellow departments is the level of equipment that the Centers for Disease Control has recommended in, in these situations. In any situation like this, as more information is obtained, as greater experiences is acquired as follow-back investigations are done in situations like what happened in Dallas. If there's a need to update those recommendations, we will update those recommendations and push that out. As I mentioned, it's likely that CDC is going to update its guidance. If that happens, we will study that, make careful note of it, 
share it with our fellow agencies here in the city and push that out to the medical community here in Philadelphia. Commissioner, is, Commissioner, are your employees at the city health clinics uh, equipped with the same level of whole body protective gear that the firefighters, first responders are equipped with? So I think the important point here is this is not a disease that we should be trying to manage in an outpatient setting. Whether it's our clinics or whether it's any doctor's office or clinic in Philadelphia, we want to get the word out that if you have this travel history and if you have symptoms to call 911 and you can be taken to an emergency room that has the appropriate level of uh, preparedness to deal with this setting. This is, this is a situation where the optimal care is care in an emergency room. Now, so, so if, wait, 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 if, if a patient walks into one of our clinics and says, I returned from West Africa, one of these countries, these three countries uh, within the past three weeks, and has these symptoms. The immediate response, and this is the same response that is part of our guidance to any facility, is that that individual should be placed in a private room, isolated, should be given a mask, and then a physician with the appropriate level of protection there's a, further questions we can ask the head of our clinics to help to clarify this. We'll, we'll go in and obtain additional information to verify whether indeed there, there needs to be uh, further evaluation. If indeed that's the case, we will call 911 and, and ask that that individual be transferred to a hospital or to see department. It's a simple question. Do the clinic personnel have these protective suits? Yes, we have protective equipment at, currently at the level that's recommended by CDC. What kind of protective equipment? I, I think at this stage I may call on my colleague, Dr. Story, who is the head of our clinics. Dave, I think you're, I appreciate the question, and we certainly want our own personnel to be as safe as possible, but, uh, you know, I think you're going right past the initial point. Generally, people with gunshot wounds don't come to our clinics because that's not what they're for. They go to a hospital. What we're trying to communicate to the public is, if you think, for whatever reason, based on your personal knowledge of your own personal history, yes, I was in one of those countries, I think I'm sorry to experience whatever the various symptoms are, my uh, temperature is up, you should go to a hospital or you should call 911 yourself. No one walks into one of our clinics with a gunshot wound to the chest. They're not prepared to deal with that. They're walking feeling sick with flu-like symptoms. And at that moment, as the doctor said, and somebody else is going to come up, apparently there are some protective uh, pieces of, of uh, equipment for those folks. But I think, as the doctor also said, you want to put the person in a separate room, we're then going to call 911 because we still need to get that person to a hospital, which is where they belong. So the main message here is, if you think you have those symptoms, call 911 first or go to a hospital emergency room. That's what you should do. So let's get beyond whether or not you want to wander into one of our clinics. But if you're there, for whatever reason you're there, then we will do our best to deal with you. But the main issue is to get the person to a hospital, which are in fact prepared to deal with that kind of circumstance. A simple scenario, if somebody hasn't gotten that message, they walk into a clinic feeling ill, perhaps they vomit on the floor in the lobby. Right. What are the staff, what is the staff equipped with to deal with that? To come I'll let the doctor doc deal with that, but I would also ask, uh, in the most serious way, given the nature of what it is that we're dealing with, given the level of coverage, you all could be very, very helpful in this regard to get that message out as there are numerous stories about this as there will be numerous broadcasts you can run something at the bottom of the screen as you do in any number of situations there are certainly many many ways to get information to people that if you are feeling that if you're experiencing that this is what you should do this is what you don't do i assume hopefully tonight you guys will guys and gals will have some boxes up on uh, 12, 4, 6, 10, 9, whatever the various newscasts are, go to a hospital or call 911. I would just add that, as you know, 
there are five airports in this country where most, almost every pay, every person that's traveling to the United States from one of the affected countries are coming in through those airports. Individuals who are leaving these countries are interviewed and, and screened before they leave. They're also screened on arrival and new arrivals into this country from uh, people who are originating their travel from one of the affected com countries are not only screened getting on and off the plane, but they're also given information about what to do. And again, it's not just these symptoms, it's these symptoms and the history of this travel. So any person that's in this country who has recently traveled in the past 21 days from one, from one, of, these, uh, one of these affected countries in Africa will have received that guidance. We are also reinforcing that in our work and our communications with members of the West African community because they are the, the community here in Philadelphia who are most likely to have friends, family members, guests visiting. So they, we're making sure that they're aware of that. But if there are further questions about our clinics, I can ask Dr. Story perhaps to answer this. Dr. Dr. The X Factor in some of this. Why don't you let Tim answer, Dave. Uh, the, the simple question is, are the personnel at the clinics equipped with body protection other than just gloves and masks? So I think it might be helpful if I just say specifically exactly what we have. Yeah. Um, so we have gloves, we have gowns, we have masks, we have face shields. And what kind of gowns are we talking about? Um, we have gowns that um, we believe meet the requirements, although we are also in the process of ordering based on what we're learning, as Dr. Bueller alluded to. No, no foot covering, no sealed in. So we, so we don't have the leg coverings. Um, we are in the process of ordering the leg coverings. So, but I, I'd like to just reiterate the message that in terms of the outpatient setting, our emphasis with our staff has been around identifying, isolating, transporting. And the message is not, it's like dealing with a heart attack. We don't take care of people with heart attacks. We identify they're having a heart attack. We call 911, that's the point. And with this, that's really the message we've been trying to give to staff, which is don't panic. We will do our best. If, if you know, we understand why people are anxious. I think a lot of people are anxious about this. I think, you know, it, it, when, Whenever you're faced with something that's unknown or new, I think it is anxiety provoking. So it's not that we're saying to staff you can't be anxious, but we're really asking that people focus on the facts here, which is there is no Ebola in Pennsylvania, there is no Ebola in Philadelphia, but we need to be prepared in the event that that should happen. Question for yes, Dr. Bueller. The one of the, the name and you're going to get the, Dr. Story, what's your title? Uh, director of the health centers. And your full name, uh, Thomas P. Story, MD, Director, S T O R T Y. Uh, Dr. Miller <coughs> has, um, has alluded to this on a couple of occasions, but I do want to reemphasize it. I mean, we are working with a variety of federal partners, and obviously, we get um, advice and guidance based on their best uh, information at the CDC. As this evolves, and as Dr. Story indicated, uh, or even I think uh, part of maybe Walt's question. As this goes on, as we get additional advice with regard to protocols, with regard to systems, with regard to equipment, protective gear, et cetera, et cetera, we will do the things that uh, we need to do to make sure our folks are protected. But we're also trying to utilize the best advice, the expert uh, advice out of the CDC and certainly our own folks here on the ground. We've got some pretty smart people here as well. Um, and as the new directives come out or as, you know, if uh, they say, well, you know, you need to have this next level of whatever the next thing is, uh, we'll, uh, like every other city in America and, and other uh, governments, uh, we'll do everything we can to get uh, that here. But we believe we're operating at the level, uh, and in some instances exceeding uh, levels of, uh, of advice. Um, and we want people to be safe, the citizens to be safe, we want our workforce to be safe. And we're utilizing the best advice and guidance uh, that we're getting from people who do this for the uh, even trying to do. Question for Dr. Buell. Oh. 
actually, you and Andrew have right you. after a day lunch. Thank you. And then so I'll come. Given the testimony yesterday at the press conference where <laughs> there was a very different message coming from the nurses and the, the paramedics about how they felt that they were being trained and prepared, can you explain the, the disconnect between those two versions? And also, um, there have been, in, from the people who have taken care of um, the Ebola patients at Emory, the message has been very clear that the CDC recommendations were insufficient and then they they held themselves to a much higher standard and did not have the same kind of problems that Dallas did. Well, I'm certainly going to uh, ask Dr. Bill to come up. I did not directly hear the testimony, as you know, uh, I was traveling yesterday, but, <coughs> excuse me, I think, um, as Dr. Bill or, or maybe it was Dr. Story alluded to, first and foremost, um, you know, there is a significantly high level of uh, concern and anxiety uh, about what's going on. Uh, there is, and this is an observation, not a criticism. I mean, there is obviously a significant amount of uh, airtime and airplay uh, dedicated uh, to this uh, on a pretty regular basis. And so I think the anxiety level for a lot of Americans is fairly high up. At the same time, this is a very serious and significant uh, circumstance and situation, limited um, with, uh, with the unfortunate death of the one gentleman and now uh, the two nurses and then you know, who they've come in contact with and, and all of that. So there is a regularity of uh, this uh, discussion. The President uh, has been on television a number of times about this particular issue. Folks will always want more equipment, more supplies, more of the best of, of whatever can be provided. And uh, so on the one hand, I'm not particularly surprised there might be a difference of opinion. I don't know where those, any particular nurses or personnel work or what's going on in their uh, work circumstance. I generally take the position on most issues that, uh, you know, there's always something more you can do. There's always something better uh, that you can do. The, you know, as some might say, you know, belts, suspenders, everything else that, that goes with it. Uh, but I think, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Bueller, I think you have to go, you know, uh, hospital by hospital or institution by institution and really get to the heart of what folks are talking about. I can't speak with any um, uh, expertise about uh, Emory uh, versus Dallas, other than the fact that I believe Emory has a highly specialized, uh, you know, center was the first one uh, that we saw, uh, which is probably way beyond of what uh, you know many uh, hospitals in America might have. But it was, you know, I think pretty much built uh, for that because I think that one is, in fact, uh, nearby, if not next door to uh, the CDC. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Bueller to talk about any of the activity from yesterday and, and the concerns that, uh, that people express and the difference uh, as uh, as we. Uh, I don't know that I can do any better than the answer that you just heard, but let me add a few additional points. One is as a physician, uh, one of the first things that you learn in medical training is that uh, any doctor is very wise to pay attention to the nurses, and the physician who doesn't do that does that at his or her peril. So clearly the message from the nurses is something that we need to be paying attention to. Secondly, as we spoke with every hospital on the call last week, what we heard was that all of them have been aware of this situation, not just since Dallas, but, but since the outset of this problem, and have been rethinking their preparedness plans, reviewing their procedures, anticipating how they would manage a patient like this, and in a number of instances, planning to take steps above and beyond the existing CDC guidance. As Claire Nutter mentioned, in any situation, there's always going to be this type of debate. And the question after what's happened in Dallas is what's the appropriate response? Again, if the, the new guidelines that come up uh, call for a higher level of protection, then that will be the base of our recommendations. I would also emphasize that every university is one of four places in the country, four places that have an extraordinary level of, uh, of 
capacity to care for patients with, with uh, unusual, very highly contagious diseases. What's the capacity that this exists in those four hospitals is not a level that we can expect could be very widely replicated. But we do need to learn from their experience. We need to learn from the experience of Dallas, we need to learn from the experience at, at Emory and the other hospitals like that. And I'm, I'm confident that CDC is taking all of those inputs as they reconsider their recommendations for infection. Dr. Dr. Bueller, you I mentioned one of the X factors in this whole thing may well be and we've seen it theoretically in this case with the gentleman down in Dallas, is that people aren't always as candid as they should be about where they've been and, and so forth. There's so much planning you can do. How concerned are you about people who, for whatever reason, uh, may not be as candid as they should be about where they've traveled, who they came in contact with, and so forth? We can't force people to tell the truth. We can only wish that people act in their own best interest. And it's in their best interest to be fully forthcoming. If, you're, if, if you have a history of travel from, the, from an affected country and you're symptomatic, it's in your best interest, it's in your family's best interest to share that information with your health care provider fully. I think also after the situation in Dallas where the patient gave the history of his travel and was sent home was a very sobering reminder. And I, I don't think that any hospital is going to repeat that mistake and, and they're going to be persistent in, in following up on those questions. Doctor, we've learned that the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania is, being, is building an isolation chamber and will be designated as a regional treatment center. And, uh, what is the city's involvement with that in terms of uh, other hospitals? I, I really can't speak on behalf of the University of Pennsylvania. We're in touch with every hospital. I've spoken with the executive director of that hospital. But uh, I think that's an example of, of hospitals going above uh, the current recommendations, perhaps anticipating higher level of recommendations. So if a hospital has that capacity, uh, then they may be one that would be able to receive referrals, willing to receive referrals for patients who are more severely ill. Not just, just, yes, right. For this particular threat, is there a hospital that the city is looking for, a specific hospital, that would become the primary consumer? No, we have not done that. We have not taken the step of asking any hospital to be that regional hospital. The federal government has, as the representative from CHOP mentioned yesterday, reached out with an interest in expanding its network of hospitals that might receive people that are being evacuated from U.S. citizens being evacuated from, from Africa. But for our purposes, we have not taken that step. This has been a very active topic of conversation within the hospital network here. We have a representative, I believe, from the hospital association who may want to, to amplify this. But we have not taken the step yet, and I can't say that we will, of making those designations. But we do want to work with the hospital association, work with the hospital community in Philadelphia, to make sure that we're able to take the best possible care of any patient if indeed we are confronted with a challenging care for a patient. Okay. Question for Commissioner so uh, Sawyer. You mentioned a little while ago that there was, that you had ordered 1,700 protective uh, uh, kits. These are your clothing kits that, for your folks. Could you step up just to give me a quick sense of when those might be expected? And so, just so folks are clear, you have enough of what you really need right now, but you're ordering 17 more for whom? How, how's that work, and when would you expect those suits to arrive? I mean, is that something that's imminent, or? Well, we already have 700 on hand presently. We ordered an additional 1,000 to replace the ones that may, be, that may need to be replaced. So we already have 700, and there's another 1,000 on board. How long before those would arrive? They should be here within the next 30 days. 30 days? Yes. Commissioner, what kind of training are the paramedics getting to, to deal with these situations as first responders? They're getting hands-on training from all the EMS supervisors, as you may or may not be aware, we just expanded the EMS system where we have additional supervisors. So those supervisors are meeting with each platoon paramedic, all the paramedics, and giving them hands-on training to try on the suit so they get used to doing this because this is not something we do every single day. 
and I want to add also, I have the utmost confidence in our members to get this done. Our, we have the number one fire department. These members are well trained, made to perform. So with the hand, more hands on training, they'll be better at putting this on. Once again, I said earlier, there's been no cases saying that the suits don't work. Every instance of contamination has been either putting it on incorrectly or taking it off. And the first responders are the medics, but occasionally they're out of service on call, and rank and file firefighters are pressed into service to respond to some of these ambulance cases. Uh, what kind of training and protective gear are they getting? They're going to receive the same training, the same technique. Commissioner, given the... Given and we the already have 700 <coughs> trained right now. There's 700 Sorry. pieces of equipment. So, Sorry. As the health commissioner said, the CDC is expected to revise its standards. And that could very well happen several times over the next 30 days by the time this additional thousand come. Now, what do you do? What do you do if those thousand arrive and they don't meet the standards? Well, we'll adjust. One of the things we do in the fire service is we adjust. Whatever it takes, of course, to meet that standard that the CDC sets, we'll meet that standard. So uh, right now, we're meeting the standard as it is right here today. If it changes tomorrow, we meet the standard tomorrow. If it changes next month, we'll meet it next month. So whenever the standard changes, we as a department and a fire service uh, professional organization will meet that standard. We'll change this company. Yeah. And obviously, you can't anticipate what the next standard is going to be. Um, but you know, I've tried to emphasize a couple times here that we'll do everything we can um, to meet or exceed uh, those various uh, standards as they come out. Uh, and at any point in time, uh, it's our goal certainly to meet or exceed whatever the current uh, standard uh, is. Uh, again, going back to Bruce's question. Um, <laughs> Getting the information uh, needed, as Dr. Bueller said, is uh, the first and foremost uh, test in all of this. The second is making sure that all personnel involved, whether it's from uh, first responder, uh, EMS personnel, firefighter, people in the clinic, uh, folks at a hospital, following those protocols and procedures are critically important, and certainly having uh, the equipment uh, and supplies that are necessary to deal with this. If everyone uh, does as best they can to do their part, people are honest uh, about their travel, about uh, their current health situation, folks have the equipment uh, that is necessary, 700 suits uh, for uh, the fire department. Uh, there are no known cases uh, here in Philadelphia. Significant coordination uh, with the hospital and healthcare uh, community for the moment, the best we can do is to be as best prepared uh, as we can with nothing going on uh, at the moment. Should something occur, uh, we are fully uh, prepared to uh, mobilize uh, immediately uh, and with a level of coordination, city, state, federal, hospital, uh, and uh, first responder uh, community in particular, uh, we're geared up and ready to go. Uh, and um, you know what's Obviously, you know, this is, you always hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Mayor, uh, probably cannot address this for any number of reasons. At the governor's press conference. But you're asking anyway. <laughs> of course. Of course. It, the, uh, it is uh, what you do. The governor's, <laughs> thank you. the governor's press conference, uh, they announced that three Pennsylvania residents are under observation. They happen to be on one of the political points. Anything that brings that in any way, shape, or form to anybody being from Philadelphia or anything? Well, one, I have no information about um, any of those individuals. I thought I heard it was two, maybe it was three. I don't know the context of the governor's remarks, uh, other than, you know, I guess it's an interesting uh, piece of information. Again, as we started this, and, you know, we'll go as long as we need to. Um, the disease, is not, the, the disease is not an airborne disease. As best I understand, uh, the individual, happened to be the nurse, was presenting no symptoms at that time. I don't know where in Pennsylvania uh, the two or three people who may have been on that particular plane um, are from. As best I know, uh, they're not from Philadelphia. Uh, but, I, I mean, I think, again, we have to be very, very careful 
Um, and you know, there, there is, there, you all have a job to do, we have a job to do, and, and we figure out a way to exist in the, in the same environment. We have a responsibility to try to provide as much information um, and uh, detailed information as possible. We air that information, print that information, report that information as best you can. There is a line, I believe, uh, between uh, actively informing the public um, and potentially scaring the hell out. So we start hearing about, you know, planes from certain countries, et cetera, et cetera. Well, this was a domestic plane. The plane never left U.S. airspace. So I think we have to be very, very careful about you know, what we say and how we say it and what's the purpose um, and, and all of that for context of what it is that we're dealing with. We have not one case in Philadelphia. We have not one scare in Philadelphia. You have a team of people. We couldn't fill this, we, we couldn't have all the folks who are actively involved in the planning and the execution of the kind of mobilization, uh, if necessary, uh, would overwhelm this room. We have faced other contagious disease issues in the past. I know it's been a while ago, but as I said yesterday, in a different setting, you know, in the aftermath of 9-11, we were all worried about anthrax, which actually is here to some extent. We shut down the U.S. Postal Service because people were mailing uh, anthrax, anthrax all around the What happened? Guidelines and procedures went out. If you have a suspicious envelope, don't open it in a big room with a whole bunch of folks. Put it over somewhere else. Call 911. Call the federal government. Call somebody. This is the same kind of situation. It's it's something to be concerned about, but it should not dominate our lives at the moment. We know what we're doing. We have the personnel in place. If everyone does their part, you wear your protective gear. You know, Dave asked about, you know, somebody vomiting something. Well, I don't know anybody that just walks up to somebody else's vomit uh, and starts cleaning it up without the appropriate uh, uh, protection. I mean, you can do it for your kids, but you know, beyond that, you know. And so, given the current context, I think we just need to be mindful that there is something bad. Out there. Well, there are a lot of bad things in the world. This is the one that's of the most uh, immediate uh, uh, concern. But we've been paying attention for some time, not just because of the recent, you know, deluge of uh, coverage. I mean, we've been paying attention to this for a while. But I think it really is important that citizens know, people in the viewing area know. We're prepared, coordinating with the state and federal government. We've talked with our partners uh, in the, um, certainly in southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, that we're focused, but that folks need to stay calm. And we're prepared. Last question. Thanks a lot. Thank you.